right, I think we're gonna get started, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so hello, my name is Christine Bobes metcalf I'm the Vice Chair of the Board. On behalf of the Board and the staff, we want to thank you all for being here tonight, the 2024 Legislative Wrap. Um, first, we want to thank the Cranston Library. They've been amazing hosts and guests for, uh, hosts to us tonight and for many events, and we're very grateful for them uh, for providing this wonderful space. Um, they're also providing restrooms, if anybody would like them, in the back to the right. Um, just a little housekeeping. Um, and the last housekeeping before we get started is if everyone could just either silent or use their cell phones um, just during the program, that would be great. Um, I also like to, I know sometimes we do this toward the end of the events, but I also want to take an opportunity to thank the staff at the ACLU. Um, Steve, Megan, Zoe, um, Monica, just for everything um, going on. Oh wait, sorry about that. Um, thank you for the event. They've been doing such amazing work this year and organizing everything. participating in different events this year. You'll hear more about those um, upcoming, and so we're very grateful to all the members who joined us today and throughout the year. Um, so now, let's get a wrap up. So each summer, we come together as an organization to reflect on the past legislative year, the wins, the losses, some things that, um, what I sometimes refer to as the good, the bad, and the ugly um, of the session. Um, and each session and each summer, when we do that reflection, they're starting to get more and more challenging, unfortunately. Um, particularly after the events of this past weekend, um, it really is important that we take the moment to stop and reflect about where we are as a country um, and where we are as a state. Um, and it's also important for us to come together um, and really think about and preserve the rights that we have um, and the importance of doing that advocacy year after year and hopefully come together and be united on that. Um, and so we're going to shift over now. Um, to our legislative wrap up. And so here at the Rhode Island ACLU, I think many of you know that we lobby on a lot of bills. And we actually have a slide here um, that talks a little bit about the number of, a number of bills. And so we track 973 bills, um, and the organization lobbies on 332. Those are a lot of bills. Um, and so tonight you're gonna hear from three individuals who are no stranger to the struggles of advocating on just not those bills, but a lot of other bills. Um, and their continued work as they trek up there every day after day um, to fight for all of us. Um, what we're going to do is we do track all those bills, um, but we're not going to talk about all those bills tonight, um, but we are going to try to talk about the bills that you hear about. Some of you, some of you may have heard about Leobor, which is the police officer's bill of rights in the media and the press. You will hear about that bill, but we also want to talk a little bit about bills that you might not hear about. Um, every day that are important, that are um, essential to us both protecting and trying to advance our civil liberties. So how the program is going to work is we're going to have each panelist, I'm going to do a quick introduction of each of them. They're each then going to talk about a series of bills, about three minutes per bill, so we have groups of bills that we're going to go through. Um, and then at the end, we're going to take some questions and answers, and so we'll just open it up for the last 15 minutes or so for the audience, um, and then we'll go from there. Um, so now for our panelists. And just to save on time, what I'll do is I'll quickly just introduce our panelists at the end, and just acknowledge them, and then we'll go right into the legislative wrap up so you can hear from them. Um, uh, we have three amazing uh, panelists here. Um, they have all spent years and years advocating um, either um, with in partnership with the ACLU or even in their own personal capacity, and so we're so grateful to have them here today. Um, the, of the 113 legislators this year, four had a perfect ACLU voting record, and we have two of them here um, up on the stage tonight, so we're so glad to have you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> 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 Representative Sanchez and Representative Stewart were the other two legislators, and then our two, legisl our two representatives here tonight. So first, um, with a perfect ACLU voting record, is Representative Jello. Representative Jello has served in the Rhode Island State House since 1992. She represents the east side of Providence. She is a member of the House Judiciary Committee, which she has also chaired in the past. The representative has worked on countless bills, um, including successfully adding gender identity to Rhode Island civil law in 2001. And in 2015, she was successful in passing the Comprehensive Community Police Relationship Act 
to, redu ra to reduce racial profiling in warrantless searches of minors, which we'll also hear a little bit about tonight. Um, there are also, um, these are just a few of Representative's accomplishments. She's been a staunch advocate for civil liberties and was the 2006 recipient of the Civil Liberty Libertarian Award from the Bradley ACLU. Next, with another perfect ACLU voting record, is Representative Shuri Cruz. Representative Cruz has served in the Rhode Island House since 2022 and represents the Woodlawn and Fairlawn areas of Pawtucket. Um, since being elected and even before that, she has been a staunch advocate for civil liberties, protecting the rights of those who've been shut out of the process or those who've been harmed through the criminal justice System. Representative Cruz was featured in the Today Show um, and shared her story of graduating with a GED, being incarcerated, graduating from Brown University, and being elected to the Rhode Island State House, and a lot in between there. Um, and the representative is no stranger to the struggles of the ACLU, either in her personal or professional life. She served for 10 years on the board and as chair of the Rhode Island ACLU. Um, and she was just recently named the Rhode Island ACLU lay leader. Um, of the decade for her continued advocacy. And our third finalist, our third panelist, um, I would venture to say would also have a perfect voting record. Um, if he was in the house, is Executive Director Steve Brown. Steve has been an outstanding advocate for civil liberties in our state and beyond for many years. He is one of the few, if there are any others I'm not sure of, that reads every single piece of legislation that's filed in order to find and see and make sure that there's nothing that impedes our rights. Um, Steve is not only a fixture at the State House when he lobbies, but he's a well-respected and amazing advocate in the community um, by all of his colleagues and nonprofits and throughout the state. Um, and when he's not reading legislation, he's leading the affiliate um, and overseeing all of his legal advocacy work, managing the staff that works on events, communications, fundraising, and public education. Um, and he hasn't been named yet, but I have a feeling he will be our civil libertarian of the century. <laughs> so with that, please, um, yes, so <laughs> yes. um, please, you know, join me in thanking him for being on our panel. Legislation, um, group of legislation that we're going to be talking about is legislation that was passed during the session. Representative Magella will talk about the Health Care Shield Act. Then Representative Cruz will discuss the domestic workers' minimum wage exemption. And then we'll kick it back to Representative Magella to discuss the Human Subject Research Bill. Okay, so um, the Dodds decision kind of changed everything. As we all know, regarding um, reproductive rights. And as a result, some states now are not allowing abortion or not allowing abortion after six weeks or not allowing after 15 weeks. Um, doctors, particularly, came to the state house asking for protection in law so that they could not be charged by another state, Louisiana or Florida, for having provided an abortion to a patient from Florida or Louisiana. Um, the, the legislation that we passed is quite lengthy. I think, it, as I remember looking at it, reading it through again yesterday, 18 pages of all new language. It, it finds first that gender affirming care and access to reproductive health services are a legal right in the state of Rhode Island. And then it, it gives public protection to providers of these services and that they are no matter whether it's a Rhode Island resident or a Florida resident that they're treating. It lists qualified physicians' assistants and in addition to physicians. It lists qualified physicians' assistants, genetic counselors, psychotherapists, social workers, advanced practice nurse, nurses, RNs, certified nurse midwives, licensed mental health counselors, speech 
language pathologists, occupational therapists, chiropractors, and pharmacists. I think pharmacists are perhaps one of the most important because it might be a pharmacist who is um, packaging mifepristone to send to a patient in Florida or wherever. Um, thinking about it, um, I know that there are other states that are closer to these states that have now passed these bans, but um, it is certainly possible, easy to imagine, that someone might have a relative living in Rhode Island and would think that they'll go to Rhode Island because they can have an abortion or they can have the gender affirming care and legally and stay with that relative. So anyhow, the, the le legislation goes on to say that the governor is not to comply with any extradition request. It um, makes quite clear that insurers can't charge more for malpractice insurance for uh, anyone who provides this care, and hospitals can't take adverse action against the provider for actions they've taken in another state that are legal. The physician's profile is also protected. Uh, doctor's address, telephone number, personal address, telephone number, email address, and other personal contact information that the DOH has is not to be public. Um, that's, that's yet pretty much in a nutshell. A big nutshell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the domestic, so until now, the Rhode Island Minimum Wage Act um, exempted domestic workers from its minimum wage um, and overtime provisions in our state, which is shocking to me. We have a lot of laws like this that you think it's common sense. How can one group of uh, workers not get paid the same that other groups of workers get paid, right? So, so with this legislation passing, it removed a provision that classified any individual employed in domestic service or in or about a private home. So we think of someone who works in a home, takes care of outside of the home, um, that and, and on place for that purposes of the Rhode Island minimum wage laws that they no longer would be exempt. So now they could be entitled to the minimum wage laws, which right now is at $14 an hour, and as of January 1, 2025, $15 an hour. Sadly, before this passed, um, it was they were only guaranteed $7.25 an hour based on the federal law, which I thought was really shocking. And again, we have a lot of legislation to go through, but so happy that this had passed because it was so important, right, to end a long time discriminatory practice and, and just requires employers to, that they must pay these domestic workers and individuals at least that state minimum wage, um, as well as if they go over 40 hours, they get overtime, which happens a lot with domestic workers. And we can't underscore like how important this was because these are mostly women people of color, newly immigrant. So we know this was discriminatory in its face, and, and this was just such an important bill that passed. I think it's pretty straightforward, um, and just really happy that it passed, and hopefully we can keep working on more, you know, ending discriminatory practice around uh, employment. Could I ask a question? Is this, oh. only, does this only apply to employees? Like bona fide employees, or is that that race like for you to answer that? But then we are getting a question at the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
exceptions to patient permission required when um, for you using information about that patient in in research. Exception for patient permission and acknowledgement of that when the situation was urgent the patient might die and was not in a position to be able to say yes you can use um, information about my treatment. Um, that section was deleted which had the effect of meaning that any, any no patient needs to be notified as opposed to you know, just any, the effect was more than it looked like in, at, at first. The effect is that now no patient in a hospital needs to be notified if their um, if their treatment is part of a research issue. Um, there was also a requirement in law that said that any time that that any research protocols had to be filed with the Department of Health. That was entirely stricken from the bill. So now our Department of Health doesn't know that research is being done at, at Roger Williams or, or um, women and infants. And, and they don't know. They don't know necessarily what research is going on. They, there's, there is no protocol for patient notification. Um, you know, the promise, of course, is that patients won't. Um, personal information will be protected, but, um, you know, there are probably none of you are old enough to remember, but some of you may know that in the history of our country, there have been at least a couple of times when human subjects have been used really inappropriately and to their detriment as, as subjects of research. The syphilis research carried out, I don't remember what decade it was, but some time ago is one example of that. So that was that deleting the requirement that even the protocol um, be reported, recorded with the Department of Health seemed to me to be the last straw. When we couldn't even get that deleted, I voted for it. Now we're just going to hear um, about another group of bills. These are all, um, there are about four bills that Steve's going to walk you through from the Attorney General's office. Uh, no surprise that uh, the ACLU often finds itself at odds <coughs> with the Attorney General of Rhode Island. <coughs> um, this year was no exception on a lot of uh, a lot of criminal justice bills uh, that we were very concerned about. There are four of them that I'm just going to very briefly go through. Um, the one positive thing I can say is that none of these bills ended up uh, getting enacted into law, um, and I think for good reason. Uh, the first one. Um, that generated a lot of controversy was a bill that the Attorney General put in uh, allowing his office to be able to veto a criminal defendant's right to waive their constitutional right to a jury trial. Uh, I'm sure you can imagine there are certain cases, you know, controversial cases, cases of notoriety, where a defendant might legitimately feel concerned about um, a jury, even a jury of their peers, not um, hearing the evidence in a non-biased way simply because it inflames the passions of uh, the crime is so notorious that it inflames their passions. So a, a check against that is a, a state law that gives um, criminal defendants the right to request the judge that they allow um, the judge to hear the case as opposed to a jury. Um, that has been in effect uh, for decades. And the Attorney General, in response to a particular case um, that I think was a, a perfect case for why you have, the defendants have this right, um, he put in a bill that would require the Attorney General himself 
to allow a person to waive their right to a jury trial. So it wouldn't just be the judge, it would be the prosecutor deciding what rights the defendant would have. Um, and it occurred, the background of it was a case where an individual was charged with a hate crime, which, as I said, is a perfect example of when you might, a defendant might not want to put their hands before a jury. Um, the judge who heard the case acquitted the individual, um, and the Attorney General's response was to um, propose this legislation. Um, very, uh, I, I talked to a number of legislators, and there was a lot of, of um, uh, disagreement with the Attorney General about this. It didn't end up passing out of committee on either the House or Senate side. Um, I expect the bill would be put back in next year, um, but I'm hopeful that uh, we'll get the same response. I mean, it's really important right um, that this bill would have undermined uh, if it had passed. Um, the next, the next uh, couple of bills are uh, troubling because we have been fighting uh, for the last eight or nine years dealing with the issue of justice reinvestment, looking away from uh, the mass incarceration approach that not only Rhode Island but the whole country uh, went through for decades. And um, in 2016 and 2017, uh, the General Assembly actually passed a number of very proactive justice reinvestment bills. And for a number of years, we had found that the legislature was shying away from uh, the type of get tough on crime legislation that we, we used to see every year uh, and see many bills pass um, with that get, get tough on crime approach. Um, and that has not happened in the last few years, but this year, unfortunately, we did see in the House in particular a lot of regressive, get tough on crime bills um, pass. Um, they died in the Senate, uh, fortunately. Two in particular that are uh, listed up there was on one that would have eliminated any statute of limitations uh, for certain sexual assault offenses, and another one that significantly increased um, the prison sentences for various driving offenses. Uh, in, in a couple of instances, the bill tripled um, the maximum sentence that, that could be imposed. We all know that that doesn't work. Uh, you can't just lock people up forever and expect that that will uh, take the crime rate down. Um, but uh, it was a proposal that passed the House, um, but like the, uh, the statute of limitations bill, uh, it died in the Senate, but I, I certainly do expect of both of these bills to come back next year. Uh, and then the, the last bill that I want to mention in the Attorney General's package um, is it's what um, uh, one of our attorneys called a stealth bill on a power grab. Uh, and, and there's a lot of truth to it. What it did was it gave the Attorney General uh, the ability to intervene in just about any violation of, of civil law um, by uh, filing what's known as a civil investigative demand, it's a demand that a person alleged to have violated uh, civil law, to respond, provide documents, and so forth. And what it did was, I mean, right now the Attorney General has that power in certain areas. Um, he has the power to file a suit under the state's Deceptive Trade Practices Act. I uh, think that a business is engaged in deceptive practices. What this bill did was give him the power to intervene in any civil case including cases that were in the jurisdiction of other executive agencies. So, you know, we have a Human Rights Commission that investigates discrimination in employment. Under this bill, the Attorney General could decide, I'm going to get involved in a case like that. Uh, and you go on and on down the list of executive agencies that are tasked with enforcing the laws, whether it's employment discrimination, fisher, commercial fisher, fish laws, um, all these would have been in the Attorney General's power to investigate and take action. Um, and we argued strenuously that was a, a power that no one person should have, no one office should have. Um, the, uh, the Attorney General's office, uh, we've been downplayed the, uh, the broad impact of this legislation and said that they really only want to do it for a few particular reasons. But that's not what the bill said. Um, we were unsuccessful in, in getting the House and the Senate to defeat it. Uh, the Senate, House passed it early in the session, the Senate passed it later. Um, but we um, urged a veto um, by the governor, and uh, the governor did veto the bill, and he cited um, 
our, our letter uh, in, in veto it. Now, uh, some of you may know that there's not a lot of love lost between the governor and the attorney general, so I think a lot of people may have thought that, well, this is just the, you know, the governor getting back at, at the AG. But I think any governor would have and should have been extremely concerned about the way this bill would have taken away the power of the governor's appointees to be involved in, uh, in civil litigation and give it to the attorney general. So ultimately, um, although there were a lot of bad criminal justice bills, um, when the session finally ended, um, things turned out uh, pretty well. And uh, I'm pleased with that. But uh, this is a never-ending battle, and I know there will be these and many other bills uh, in that session. So we're very thankful for the air conditioning. We're just going to get a little bit louder for our rights tonight. <laughs> and we're going to continue on this theme with some police reform bills with Representative Cruz talking about Leo Gore, the Police Officers Bill of Rights, and then Representative Jello will talk about the Comprehensive Community Police Retention Act. Unfortunately, cover some of these things up. 
Uh, longer suspensions and terminations would still give officers the right to a labor hearing, um, which cannot take place until the criminal case is over, so including the appeal when the officer is charged. Um, one of the really big concerns, and it got really heated towards the end of the session, um, for many people, especially myself, and I know the ACLU and Common Cause and many other uh, organizations have brought it up, that there was a second version early on um, that did not block the release of videos when there were these incidences. And we started to see later in the session, or towards the end, that there was a version that blocked uh, videos if they were, quote, minor offenses. Um, so really watering down transparency and access. Um, so the provision stated that police chiefs shall be prohibited from releasing any video evidence whenever a minor violation by a police officer is alleged, even if those videos um, that had been previously before this draft accessible under the state's Access to Public Records Act. So, and if passed as a really proposed, we really, you know, we were like, this is a step backwards. They were calling this increase in transparency, but yet we thought, how could any increase be if there were blocking video in this new and wonderful reform? Um, so I think it really was, fortunately, we were able to get that stricken, but I think it was really the outcry of the community, the organizations working really hard to make sure that that was put back in, that video could be accessible, regardless of whether they consider it minor or major. But that's the reason, you know, many cities and towns, you know, spend money because on a body camera to make sure that there's video evidence there. So it's not, like he said, she said, it's not a filing of a report that may or may not be accurate. But now there's some more evidence to it, and, and we want to make sure that people have access to that. Um, so with that, you know, there were some other, I think some other, um, they called it the George Floyd with litmus test. That did not get passed, so there was, you know, the caucus there, so the Black, Latino, Indigenous, Asian um, caucus really, you know, had some priority lists, unfortunately, that George Floyd witness test did not make it within it. And that again is just like how long an officer who's been involved in a shooting or an incident where somebody dies, and what does that look like, and how long do you have to wait for accountability? And, and we've seen in other states and with George Floyd in other years, years. And we've seen it here in Rhode Island with our own version of it with Officer Dolan from my city. And so that was a big concern as well, but did not get that you know piece with it. But I think from an ACLU standpoint, again, back to the importance of having that transparency, access to those videos. So if there is an incident, we'll be able to really get to the truth of it and the bottom of it, hold the accountable, um, you know, a bad actor on the police force. I would add Officer Hanley from the City of Providence to that list of officers who have um, been protected by labor for far too long. Um, Hanley's case uh, has dragged on longer even than the Hanley case, um, than the Dolan case. Um, the Comprehensive Community Police Relationship Act uh, is something that we passed in the 20 teens that required police when they stop people, whether driving or on the sidewalk, and um, have an interaction with them to record the perceived by the police officer, the race of the person stopped, their age, um, why they stopped them, uh, whether there were charges brought, whether they searched the person or the car, whether the search was voluntary or not, and whether they found anything. The state, the state carried on this data collection and the data was analyzed by the University of Connecticut. And some communities didn't do well 
there were clear indications of bias in police stops. And um, with no backup then for, you know, what the, what the charge was, um, pretext stops the call, I think. Anyhow, um, that, that legislation passed in the 20 teens, uh, that was sunset, so it stopped. We stopped doing the data collection in 2019. Uh, all of the work provided by um, University of Connecticut and the data collection costs were paid for by um, Rhode Island, or federal government, um, Federal Highway Safety Administration, so there's no cost to the state, and it's important information to have. One of the things that has stuck in my mind about that, from that earlier study, was that they found contraband in cars driven by white drivers proportionately more often than they found contraband in cars driven by drivers of color. So clearly, even the racial profiling wasn't working. Um, anyhow, we would like to get that study started again, the data collection going. It has been um, a difficult, difficult whole, um, the police don't seem to want to do it, but they're not really forthcoming about why, and they don't really talk in public about not wanting to do it. It more seems to be on the third floor of the state house. Um, so we will keep trying, didn't get it passed this year, but we'll keep trying to get the Com Comprehensive Community Police Relationship Act data collection started again. Um, and incidentally, uh, the Department of Transportation had been applying for the federal funds, they say, assuming that, that the legislation would pass. So the Boston Globe caught them on that. And um, so now this summer, they're promising by, that by early August, they'll have a report of the data collection from 2021 and 22, or 2020, 2021 and 22, I think. So stay tuned. A group of bills, which I think this category, we may start to see more and more bills. It's on technology and artificial intelligence, and Steve is going to walk us through several bills this session. Uh, thanks again. I, there are a lot of bills here. What I want to say is if you're interested in any of these or other bills, I encourage you to visit our website. Um, we have a lot of information on our website about legislation, including lots of our testimony. So you can dig a lot more deeper than you know, the few minutes we have to discuss many of these bills. So not surprisingly, uh, as Christine said, tech and AI is now a big thing in state legislatures um, and in Congress. Uh, and Rhode Island is no exception to that. Uh, there are good bills and there are lots of bad bills. I think one of the really concerning things is because this is novel, it's creating some novel issues and problems, uh, sometimes there's an urge to fix it quickly without really considering all the ramifications of those fixes. And I think that's true of a number of the bills that I'm going to very quickly go through. Um, now, uh, the first bill I want to talk to is actually a good bill. Um, it's the only good bill on this list. Um, we've introduced this uh, for a few years now, dealing with school computer privacy. Uh, right now, as you probably know, lots of students are given Chromebooks or other laptops to bring home, to do their homework uh, with. Um, and uh, what many people don't know is that in many situations, they have no privacy protections. Um, school officials actually have access to those computers 24 hours a day, and if they want to, they can actually activate uh, the camera and the microphone on those laptops. Um, there's actually a, uh, a, an infamous lawsuit from Pennsylvania from six or seven years ago where um, that's what happened. They, uh, some school officials were actually monitoring um, students while they were home, and a lawsuit was brought, and uh, the student won, but it, it provided um, some insights into the dangers 
of giving school officials carte blanche to be able to have access to, to these laptops and computers. And this legislation that we have lobbied on for the last few years would, would restrict that, would essentially bar school officials from being able to do those sorts of things. Um, the bill has passed the House the last few years. It's died in the Senate um, for no good reason that I know of, but we're hoping that um, next year will be the year that that bill passes. Uh, one bill that did pass, and the only bill in this list that passed it, was uh, a Data Transparency Act. As you see, data transparency is in quotes. Um, this was essentially an industry-written bill, and so while it creates a facade of providing consumer protection to individuals in terms of the information that's turned over when they visit a website or download an app, um, some national uh, consumer privacy organizations looked at the bill um, and they gave it an F, uh, they graded it an F. Um, they thought it was actually um, worse in some respects than uh, some of the, 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 the bad industry bills that they have seen in, in other states. Um, you know, the problem is now that it's passed, I think a lot of legislators will feel that they address the issue, um, but they will have addressed it in a very deficient way and um, we're probably going to have to recognize the fact uh, that at least for Rhode Islanders, any relief, any privacy protections uh, in visiting websites will have to come from Congress. It, it won't come from the legislature. Uh, and then there's a list of four bills um, uh, that uh, the ACLU opposed. Um, they all died, unfortunately, and I will just very quickly go over them, uh, but I do think they provide good examples of why a lot of times you really need to act cautiously before you jump into this um, artificial intelligence um, uh, issue. Uh, so explicit digital images, I mean, this sounds um, uh, like uh, who, who could oppose a bill that, uh, as this did, banned um, uh, the dissemination of visual and uh, new visual images of individuals that were artificially uh, generated. Um, and while there might be a way to address that, um, what we pointed out were the enormous ramifications of a bill that just uh, created that sort of criminal ban. Uh, at the very time that the bill was being heard, that same week, um, there were a lot of stories, um, news stories about uh, what was going on with the Taylor Swift tour and were all these fake nude photos of Taylor Swift circulating across the country. Um, and if this bill had passed, every one of those teenagers or 18-year-olds who had passed along one of these clearly fake nude photos would have been guilty of a crime. Um, and that is perhaps not the best way to deal with that issue. Uh, it's something that requires a lot more nuance and thought uh, than just a, com a complete ban. Uh, the same thing was true with this uh, electronic stalking bill, um, which um, would have, uh, as we read it, uh, made it a made it a crime for an aggressive news reporter. I'm looking at you, Pat, um, to uh, go after, you know, follow uh, a politician, you know, asking questions and the politician running away, not wanting to answer them. Um, the way this bill was worded. Um, uh, this individual would, uh, this news reporter would be engaged in electronic stalking um, if they had a camera or a microphone. Uh, and uh, we raised the concerns, and again, about the, the enormous breadth of this bill. Um, and although it passed the House, uh, it did die in the Senate. Uh, noise cameras. Uh, this was a big proposal from the city of Providence, uh, you know, the city with dozens of red light cameras, speed cameras. Uh, they wanted to add to it all by having uh, noise cameras. Um, and uh, they wanted the authority to be able to put them up around neighborhoods and be able to cite people um, for violating the city's noise ordinance. Uh, one of the interesting things was this is, a, this is a very new technology. We filed an open records request with the city um, to find out what they knew about this. We, we didn't understand exactly how it worked. How do you tell? Where the noise is coming from? You know, if you have two cars next to each other, which one is making the noise? Can it? Uh, does it uh, eavesdrop if there are conversations in front of the uh, the camera by pedestrians? So we were really interested in finding out how these work. So we filed an open records request with the city of Providence. And said, can you, since you're asking for this legislation, give us information you have about how these cameras work, who you've talked to, who the vendors are, what it costs, and we got 
zero documents back. So here they were pushing for this very potentially intrusive legislation, uh, technology legislation, and, and really having no idea how it worked, um, how it didn't work, um, or whether it made sense. Um, so fortunately, uh, they weren't able to provide answers when they were asked questions by committee members, and, and it died in committee, fortunately. Uh, and then finally uh, is a bill restricting artificial intelligence in elections through advertising and other, other means, other visual means. Uh, now, the two things that I think are, are worth noting, while people understandably are concerned about this notion of deep fakes and you know, these made up images of, of real individuals, uh, I think we have to keep in mind that this sort of deception has been occurring for ages without artificial intelligence, where you have politicians cut snippets out from a speech and put them together to make people think it. Um, uh, they were saying something else, or just a month or so ago, there was the incident with, um, that you may have read about President Biden in France during D-Day, and how uh, right-wing groups uh, took the video and manipulated it without artificial intelligence to just cut it um, a certain way to make it look like um, uh, he, he didn't know what he was doing when he was at that time. Um, but so it's, it's been going on for a long time. The other thing I, uh, that I pointed out in our testimony is, again, this is another very broadly worded bill without nuance. Um, the, day, the, day, the night before that I testified on this bill um, in House Committee, uh, I was watching a, a series on television, a science fiction series on television. I won't go into the details, but the, there's an alien invasion going on. And for about 15 seconds, um, there's an image of President Biden on a billboard um, telling people, don't pack, uh, we have this under control. Um, it wasn't actually President Biden saying that, it was made through artificial intelligence. If this bill were law, um, technically the producers of that, um, that movie um, would have been in violation by not having a disclaimer rolling under the screen saying this, is, this was by artificial intelligence. Um, so, uh, again, uh, this bill passed the House, there was just this, you know, we need to deal with these deep fakes, this is a pressing issue, um, but uh, fortunately the Senate uh, uh, prevailed in, in not passing the bill. Again, this is a bill that clearly will be back next year, but I really do want to emphasize the importance of considering um, the need for nuance in dealing with these um, these issues, because otherwise you can make a lot of innocent conduct suddenly illegal, and also infringe on very important First Amendment rights uh, in the process. So with that. So now we're going to talk about four different bills, our final group of bills that did not pass this legislative session, and we're actually gonna go to different panelists for each of the bills, and we're gonna start with Representative Agello, Sex Worker Immunity Bill. The sex worker immunity bill came out of a um, study commission that was started and chaired by Anastasia Williams, and then she lost the 2022 election, so she was tasked with taking over the, as chair of the study commission. Um, um, this was looking at marginalized workers what we call them, but marginalized workers or is another word for sex workers, which is another word for prostitutes. Um, we heard from um, marginalized workers um, about the difficulties that they face in staying safe, in living their lives, um, and one of the things that we heard really over and over and over again was that sex workers very often are victims of crimes. They may be a victim of, of a purported John who beats them up and robs them or um, rapes them. Uh, they may be um, victims in other ways because of the situation that they're in and have felt um, that they couldn't report the crime, the robbery, or the rape, or the beating to law enforcement because they would be charged with prostitution. 
So this legislation, which passed the House but did not pass the Senate, uh, gives immunity to sex workers who report crimes um, that they witness or are victim of in proximity to their work. Not, you know, they can't report that they saw someone shoplifting and then not be charged for prostitution. Um, if the police would charge them with that. So it, it um, really quite narrow, so the worker has to, has to assert charges against another, a bad actor, and he is then protect, protected from being charged with either prostitution or um, soliciting for prostitution, just those two things. There was a tremendous amount of behind the scenes muttering, worrying about this legislation. Um, and a tremendous amount that this was the end, that we were going to be, the next thing we were going to be legalizing prostitution, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but in the end, the House passed the bill unanimously and it died in the Senate. So we'll, we'll try again next year. Because people shouldn't be victimized that way. Next, we're going to hear from Steve on the access to public records reform. Uh, thank you. So this was a bill that uh, we and a number of open government organizations worked a lot on this year. Uh, it was a comprehensive um, revision to our state's access to public records act. Um, it has not been revised in over a decade, and it shows, um, I think all of you have heard or read stories about reporters and others trying to get information and, and running into enormous obstacles because of uh, the way that our open records law is worded and uh, implemented. And this bill attempted to make numerous changes. It would have made it easier um, to obtain records without paying exorbitant costs, it would have required public bodies to provide more information before they redacted or withheld records. And uh, ultimately, it, 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 it made a sea, I think it would have made a sea change in the way the law operates. Um, but doing it in ways that were not overly burdensome uh, from our point of view. Uh, unfortunately, that was not the point of view of public bodies themselves. Um, and the governor helped. Uh, a lead a campaign, 20 state agencies um, filed testimony against, um, against the bill and uh, came up with uh, a lot of specious arguments on, on a lot of the provisions. I mean, some of them you might understand that the uh, public body might say it's burdensome, but a lot of the, a lot of the arguments were completely uh, specious, um, didn't hold up at all, but it was, it, it was a campaign of throwing everything against the wall and, and seeing what stuck. Um, so as a result of that very um, uh, unified opposition from the state executive branch, um, we weren't able to get this bill moving anywhere. Um, but the Senate sponsor in particular, uh, Louis de Palma, is um, very committed to it. And uh, we're going to be back next year pushing the bill. We might make tweaks here and there. But we're also going to uh, hold these state agencies accountable for their arguments. And, and poke the holes in them that uh, that they really have, and, and we'll see what happens. Next, you'll hear from Representative Cruz on threats against school officials. Thank you. So, um, this bill came along out of a concern from superintendents. It was a bill from superintendents concerned about parents who were going to school board meetings and getting into heated debates and really worried about, you know, when parents are speaking emotionally about their child's education, which usually is what happens when your, your child and something that includes your child in a school. Um, so, so this bill or this legislation would work to include any school staff um, that would apply that it would be a felony if, if anyone directly or indirectly um, verbally or written, um, threatened to inflict bodily harm on that person 
or um, by one of their family members. And you know, the real con the concern with this was one, I think we went so far with doing a lot with criminal justice reform and moving forward, and there were already existing laws in place for this type of behavior. So it was really a concern that we're doubling down, increasing penalties. And I think, in addition, it was for anyone. And I think that became a clear debate that it also included children. Children, whether they had IEPs, children regardless how old they were in school, to not if they were six years old or 17 years old, that if they were to spew off something you know, indirectly or directly, hey, I'll see you outside, or whatever it was, wrote it down on a piece of paper that now they could be faced with this, you know, increased penalty of a felony. Um, so it was really concerning to see this bill on so many levels, whether it was parents who were expressing a concern in emotional states at, you know, school board meetings, or whether it was a child in a school, in a classroom. Um, I think even more so, and I had, you know, during testimony, whether it was in committee or houses on the house floor, was, you know, we have a new makeup as well in schools where we have police in schools. And if a police, uh, you know, hears this indirect or perceives it, now there was that ability where they could just arrest your child on site and increase it and have an increased penalty. So it was clearly a school to prison pipeline piece of legislation, and it was very concerning, and really around free speech as well, when you talk about parents and, and having, whether it's an IP meeting or a school board meeting or whatever it is, that sometimes it gets emotional and, and things are spewed off that aren't necessarily meant to be a threat, or, or even there's evidence to be that they would, they would be carried out. So this was a real concern. Um, I'm, I'm happy that you know it passed the House, which was very upsetting, but did not make it to the Senate. So it could be something that we, we may see again, hopefully not. Um, but again, that's, this was, again, a, a bill moving in the wrong direction in our state. We're trying to go the other way when it comes to criminal justice reform. And these were already, it's already a penalty on the books, so why increase and continue to double down and increase our you know, funding again to for things we need with school and not for prison systems. So, um, and Steve, uh, we'll wrap this section up a bill that did not pass, and he'll talk about the obscenity protections for librarian librarians. Uh, thank you. I think it's appropriate to end the list uh, with this bill here at the William Hall Library. Uh, this was a very good bill that we strongly supported. Um, what it uh, did was amend the state's obscenity law. Um, to make clear that um, uh, libraries, schools, museums um, were not subject to obscenity prosecution based on their providing of literature materials that they deemed uh, to be uh, appropriate in those institutions. Uh, this didn't come out of thin air. You may know there have been uh, some fights, not only, I'm sure you're aware of the fights across the country, there have been fights here in Rhode Island. Uh, there was one very nasty one in Westerly in particular where there was an attempt to charge a librarian um, with obscenity uh, because of her um, uh, keeping books on the shelves that some people did not approve of. So uh, coming out of that was this bill that the Library Association and, and many others uh, supported. Um, it passed uh, the Senate. Uh, unfortunately, it died in the House. I know there will be a strong effort next year to have it go all the way. Uh, these, these battles are not ending. Um, this is going to be a continuous problem, and uh, we believe that uh, librarians um, deserve the protection uh, that this bill would provide them. So. And so that is the wrap up of the legislation. Um, we're going to open up to questions in a second. I'm sorry, I was like, we did one last thing that Steve, I think, is going to talk about um, before we get into questions and answers. And so uh, to, to end uh, this part of the, uh, the panel discussion, I did want to spend a minute talking about something that will be appearing on the November ballot. Um, it is a question as to whether Rhode Island should hold a constitutional convention. Um, the ACLU is strongly opposed to that idea. We're very concerned about the impact that such a convention can have on civil liberties and civil rights. And those concerns are not hypothetical. 
Um, Rhode Island is the last state in the country to have held a state constitutional convention, even though a dozen other states also put to their voters uh, over a period of time, 10 years or 15 years, the question whether one should be held. Um, some of you may know that the, the one that was held in Rhode Island last was in 1986, and while it was um, well, the people said that this would be a great opportunity for the public to be able to have their say in, in, um, in legislation uh, and not be stymied by politicians. Um, the uh, major uh, constitutional amendment that came out of that convention was a proposed constitutional amendment declaring that life began at conception. Um, there was a very uh, heated um, public campaign, uh, both for and against it. Uh, ultimately, that constitutional amendment was defeated by the voters um, when it was put on the ballot. Um, but uh, what many people don't know is a lot of other bad things did pass. Um, so there were actually two anti-abortion amendments. There was that one. There was another one that actually yet got enacted. It is in our state constitution now. It prohibits anybody from interpreting our state constitution to protect abortion rights. Um, so, in a lot of other states, especially after Dobbs, you see state courts holding that their state constitutions provide their residents a right to an abortion. We can't do that in Rhode Island. Though. We, we have to rely solely on statutes and what the legislature has done. We can't go into court like in, in many other states and argue that our state constitution protects this important privacy right because of something that came out of the last constitutional convention. That last constitutional convention also passed a very bad amendment dealing uh, with the right to bail, restricting the right to bail for certain drug offenses. Um, and it also uh, 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 proposed and the voters approved a constitutional amendment that vastly expanded the number of people uh, who would be disenfranchised from voting because of a felony marriage. Um, uh, ironically, it was the legislature itself that a few decades later um, approved and brought to the voters and the voters approved the constitutional amendment to undo that um, so that now um, individuals are not um, and do not lose their, their right to vote uh, simply because they're, they're a felon. Um, we are concerned, especially in this age, you know, 40 years later, um, we now know that anybody can spend unlimited amount of money, uh, unlimited amounts of money on a campaign. Out-of-state interest can come in with their own proposed pet projects and there's nothing that can be done to stop them. And uh, the only way to ensure that that won't happen uh, is to vote no in November when you're asked um, should, should there be a constitutional convention held. Um, so I wanted to get that message out. You'll be hearing more of that from us uh, in the months ahead leading up to the November vote. Um, but uh, we have lots of information that we can share about why this is really a dangerous idea even though it's touted as a way to get the public involved and, and promote good government uh, measures that might otherwise not pass through the past legislature. Thank you. We can always take a second to thank our panelists for because for the most part, people don't pay their domestic help like employees anyway. So is, is, that, is that a way around it that kind of the of the value of it? Right, and I wish I could answer that definitively okay. because I did hear that debate, and it's my understanding, no, because it's not, so you're not the employer, it's an independent contract, like it's a short term. Right. I mean, nobody really gives their babysitter a W-2. Right, and, and there are, and I was just saying to, Christine, because I had I literally printed out because it's a small it's it's the Rhode Island Minimum Wage Act and it's two pages and a half and and it does outline some of those exemptions like that doesn't apply to that where like, this was just one, one line drawn out for a domestic worker you're the employer of domestic workers we're talking about full time like nannies people who work in or about the home yeah. so I did I I don't sit on that committee and I remember it hearing it really quickly and that it doesn't, but again, I don't want to double check on that, but if there's someone else that knows that definitely on this panel, um, but it is a good question because that's a contract, 
it's not like you're a contract worker, it's a short term, and it's not like that. It's my right, understanding. Kind of disadvantaged by not being employed. Right. I think someone did bring that up in the committee, which I wasn't in, but again, I think, yeah, it doesn't. Okay. But I can, I can double check through it. Next. So some would argue that AI is this generation's blockchain, and it's 20 years ago's Y2K. The technologist Ken Block today pointed out that the State Committee on AI uh, includes alarmingly few true technologists. That you've got a lot of people, with, I'm sure wonderful people, very broad experience, no specific tech experience. So my question is, is the political process, and this is a question writ large, uh, on, on a technical issue, is it including the type of informed and expert witnesses necessary to do the deep dive you need to do on AI? because of the civil libertarian concerns, which are incredibly valid, incredibly critical, and more desperate than anything we probably faced as a civil liberties community, are they going out and reaching out to experts, or is this just another, hey, that's a good idea, this loses that sort of. Yeah, uh, that's, uh, that's an excellent question. I too, uh, um, I too had some concerns looking at the makeup of this, this commission, for those who don't know, the governor, uh, who an executive board has set up an, an AI commission with a broad mandate. Um, and it, it was unclear to me whether it, it's composed, again, I also have nothing bad to say about the individuals who are actually appointed, but whether they have the expertise that's needed um, to really dive into the issue and come up with the right answers, I think is a, is a question. We're going to be monitoring the commission and, and see where it goes. But I think anybody who's concerned about this issue ought to also be monitoring it and, and being prepared to provide input when necessary and encouraging those who do have expertise uh, to get involved in some way as well. And so I hand over here. Yep. My question is about the human subject research bill because as I was driving here tonight, I heard a story about the Tuskegee studies, which went from the 30s to 72, and it was in the news because the whistleblower on that just recently died. So my question is, who was lobbying for that bill? Because you said it did pass. I don't know who was lobbying for it because it didn't, wasn't heard in a committee on which I sit. So I didn't, didn't hear directly. But I have heard that it was Brown University, most of which is in my district. Um, but for their establishment, because they do a lot of research. Studies. They do a lot of research. Thank you. Any questions? Right here? Yeah, I was going to ask about the same bill, that what was the rationale for it? It just seems so intrusive that people wouldn't be aware that they were a research subject. Uh, again. So it was Brown University that was pushing it, along with the Department of Health. Um, what it, just to clarify, it's not a, it's not a complete you know no consent or, or anything. What Rhode Island had had stronger standards than the federal government when it came to um, doing this type of non-consensual um, patient subject research, and the at least the original intent of the bill was to have Rhode Island law mirror federal standards which still it would require an institutional review board to review the study and so forth. But the concern, the major concern we had was what Representative Magello mentioned, is that at the last minute, um, they amended the bill, and it was like the day or two before the session ended, it was the first time this happened. They amended the bill to get strike a requirement in the law um, that said when uh, a hospital or other facility engaged in this type of non-consensual research. They had to submit their protocols to the Department of Health for public um, scrutiny. Uh, and that was deleted. And that is what especially concerned us. It concerned a number of other organizations. Uh, the Mental Health Advocate opposed the deletion of that requirement. Um, and it was bad in and of itself. It was bad in the way it happened uh, with nobody. There was never any testimony about it. Uh, it just came out of nowhere. And, um, and it struck us as very troubling. I mean, it's one thing to say, look, uh, for Brown University or others to say we're being hampered by this st very strict state law. It's another thing to say that we also want to keep it secret and not tell people what we're doing. Any other questions? I have a question. Oh, I, I think it was 
suicidal vow. I'm a survivor of domestic violence and so for many years and recently I experienced a horrible, this is my first meeting here, a horrible, um, brutal attack from the police here in Rhode Island. Um, so when I heard, I'm not sure what your name is in the white, but when I heard you say, you know, earlier, that still resonated with me. Um, and I want to know what I can do. Um, I was driving by myself. Initially, it was, you know, a stop. And then um, I was attacked. I was thrown to the ground. I had bruises all over my body and went to the hospital. This is completely, you know, it's and it's given me PTSD. Um, so I want to know what it is that I can do to, you know, to help me and to help others. Because I'm pretty sure this happened to other people. And I'm not saying with racial profile, but you know, I am Latina. Um, what I'm saying is, the way they attacked me, I mean, before I had domestic violence abuse, and I'm a survivor of that, so I know they've attacked other people, you know? So I need to know what I can do to help me, what I can do, uh, connect with the ACLU to bring these, bring justice for me and to any other people that they hurt, um, you know, that's what I want to know. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing that. And, and I'm sorry you had to go through that. And that was one of the reasons, too, as you heard, you know, why any reform, if not reveal? Because I don't understand, um, you know, a profession that has so much power and weapons gets that extra layer, especially when they're accused of assaulting someone in a, in a manner. So I think one, coming here and connecting with the ACLU, hearing about this is definitely a good step. Also, too, one, taking care of yourself and then sharing that story again with others because, again, you are not alone. There are more. And I think by coming out, you'll know that there are others that who have been assaulted, abused, have been impacted by police violence. And it's happening every day. So I want to thank you, one, for your courage to stand up and share that. Yeah, and, and these are some of the legislation and, and really what the ACLU works on. And is, I guess, I'm a little biased, but always the first to respond when it comes to those types of incidents, when it comes to police who aren't afraid, who aren't going to shy away, who are going to come out and address it and ask for that you know, body camera, that transparency, and start to, and hold them accountable. And that's what we need, but we also need people who have been impacted, who have been harmed, to, to be brave enough to, to stand up and share that, because a lot of times people say, oh, it's not happening, it's not close enough to them to actually fight for it. And by you coming out, it says, it is close. In this small room, I've been a victim of police violence, been a victim of police violence. I'm not gonna, you know, have anyone help themselves, but I'm sure there's someone else. And and anywhere you go, so you know it's a big problem, especially here in our state. So thank you. Um, they did it with uh, voting rights, 
um, for uh, rap songs. Uh, they, uh, one of the, um, they got rid of uh, Providence, uh, Providence, Plantata, Providence Plantations from the name of the state. Uh, so uh, there have been a number of constitutional amendments that have uh, come through the General Assembly. It is, um, uh, it's not easy, uh, and, and you have frustrations from some individuals who have proposed amendments that um, don't pass the legislature, so they think the convention is the way to, to go instead. And, and, you know, that's wonderful in theory, but in practice, um, you know, the amendment you want is not necessarily the amendment that the person next to you wants. Um, and it opens it up to any and all possible changes. And uh, some of us who believe in the rights of the minority are concerned about what the majority might do uh, with, with the power of the convention. And as I said in the beginning, um, we, we're not just being hypothetical about this. We, we have a history. We know how it can happen. And uh, I think it would be a big mistake to try it again. I just wanted to add, as a survivor of that kind of time, uh, you go back in the Dominant uh, Journal Archives and you will be amazed at the crap that was going on a lot of that. And uh, that was good. Uh, just, just a very brief add to that. The convention was as political as any state legislature, is what Steve was saying. Uh, legislators um, agreed that they would not run for office, um, and none of them did. Seven former legislators did. The Speaker of the Houses, son and sister, both were delegates to the Constitutional Convention. And we could go on and on with all the politics. So if you think that the convention is a way for the people to control what happens, um, Again, take a look at the history and, and you'll be disabused of that notion fairly quickly.